guys, my name is Patrick Hamilton, and I completed my Theater 2 project on the Grand Opera House and the Houdini Trap Door. So according to the Grand Opera House website, the Grand was built in 1884, and at the time, it had the largest stage in the southeast, which is a pretty big deal. So through my research on this project, I interviewed both the Director of Operations and the Technical Director at the Grand. They gave me some pretty cool insight on the theater and, and a few facts that I had never heard before. Uh, for instance, uh, Harry Houdini actually performed at the Grand Opera House, and it is speculated that some of the trap doors that the Grand still uses today, some believe that these trap doors were actually built by his carpenter. At the end of this video, I go into depth into one of the trap doors that they use, and uh, I also show you the mechanisms behind it. Um, so some of these mechanisms are actually explained in chapter 14. Uh, Brockett goes through actually the star trapdoor. Uh, some of the concepts are, are pretty similar. I hope you enjoy. I'm here with Bob Mavity. Bob Mavity is the technical director of the Grand Opera House. And today he's going to tell us a little bit of the history behind the Grand. Well, the Grand was originally built in 1884 as the Academy of Music. It was a male vocal academy, and it housed both classrooms, rehearsal spaces, and the auditorium for the students. It would remain the Academy of Music for, for a number of years. Um, I believe that the uh, time frame when it changed was uh, 1905. In 1905, it then they added the office building. It's in the front of, of, of the theater and did away with the original facade. Uh, after they had done the renovation and did the change, they would added the outer lobby, which still stands today with the big domed arch that goes through, and uh, also opened it up to have shop spaces on either side. Now, at the time that the theater was built, it was uh, a freestanding building, whereas now it's attached to the courthouse with the annex building. Um, and later on, when they added the office building, it was attached to, to other buildings next to it. Part of what they could do during that time frame is they utilized the peanut gallery, which is our second balcony. The second balcony is referred to as the peanut gallery for a specific reason. Uh, the type of refreshments that they were served, they would get shelled peanuts. And what would happen is, is that they would eat their peanuts, throw their peanut shells on the ground, just like you do at, at some restaurants today. And then when the performance ended, they had ushers that came through with specially designed uh, brooms and they would go from the inside out sweeping the peanut shells out. The reason they did that is because this, the floor itself actually slopes slightly from the center out going both directions. And so they would sweep the peanut shells to the outside, open the doors, they had chutes on, on the outside, they would sweep them into the chutes and would carry them down to the lower level into barrels where they collected them at the bottom. And then of course it would be taken out and used for, for other things after that. Now during that time frame, once they'd made the change, uh, a lot of great things started happening here. 1908, the original touring production of Ben-Hur uh, performed on the stage here, complete with treadmills, uh, scrolling backdrops, and live Arabian horses on stage. Charlie Chaplin, John Philip Sousa, uh, they were all here, uh, part of fundraising efforts. Uh, Sarah Bernhardt, Will Rogers, George Burns, and Gracie Allen. Uh, Lionel Barrymore, Ethel Barrymore, Bob Hope, Allman Brothers, Ray Charles, all of them performed on the stage throughout the years. Uh, another person that had performed here was actually Harry Houdini. Harry Houdini did, came in and did his production here. Now the way that worked was that he would not announce ahead of time that he was coming uh, because in that day and age it was all not about, uh, you know, you didn't have the instant access that you do today. So he would send his carpenter ahead of time to put in the trap doors and the, all the, the things necessary for his, uh, for his illusions. And um, so he would come in ahead of time, put all those in, and then on the given day, once he was finished, uh, Mr. Houdini would then come into town with a big fanfare, you know, drawing a lot of attention. It doesn't take much uh, in a small town at that time, and you come in and people think, oh, it's just coming in time straight to the theater and do your performance. And because they don't know that there'd been a carpenter here working for a week or two beforehand, it's magic. Uh, 
we still actually have one functioning uh, trap door from that era. Um, some of the equipment that is used in it now is still the original equipment that was put in by his carpenter. After talking with Bob Mavity, the idea of a Houdini trap door really interests me. I asked a few more questions, and luckily I was able to see the device for myself. Philip Banzi, the director of operations of the Grand Opera House, was kind enough to show me the Houdini trap door, and also explain a little bit how it works. He also gave me a full demonstration of the mechanics of the entire device. We began our journey on the stage deck. Phil began explaining a little bit and showed me where the door was located. On the stage, you can see a faint outline of where the insert is for the trap door. So the entire concept basically relies on this single insert below the stage that raises and lowers in order to make the stage flat and flush or to open it up where you have a hole leading from the top of the stage to the basement. Once Phil explained this a little bit, he took me downstairs to the basement to show me the mechanics of how exactly everything went together. As we reached the basement, I was kind of surprised with how simple this mechanism seemed to be. The whole entire concept was basically just around levers and pulleys, just simple machines. So this insert that's raised up into the trapdoor hole, you pull a lever down which lowers the insert beneath the stage. Then that insert falls onto a track system. On that track system, the insert is attached to a rope and pulley system. On the other end, there would be a stage hand that would snatch that rope down and then it would pull the insert over to the side, which would then reveal a hole leading up to the stage or down beneath to the basement. So basically, actors or stage hands would get on the stage through this hole. They would either appear up through the hole or disappear down through the hole. So this entire concept, basically, an actor or stage hand would go up or down on a tiny elevator. Now they have basically a boat winch used to raise this tiny elevator up and down for members to get above stage to below stage and vice versa. Beforehand it was an entire pulley system. So basically you would have one person pulling a pulley and it would raise another insert up with the actor or stage hand on this insert. As they pulled it up, the person would seamlessly appear on stage. Once that insert was completely up, it seemed as if the stage was completely flat. You couldn't see the hole at all from the audience. Next up, you'll see a short demonstration of exactly how this Houdini trapdoor works. I got Phil to show me exactly the mechanisms, and also he implemented it entirely. I got a couple of different angles and spliced it together, so maybe it's, it's a little bit easier to understand exactly what's going on. As discussed earlier, you can see exactly how the trap door falls into place. You pull down the lever, it drops down the insert, the insert slides out, and then opens up the hole for all. Once that hole is open, then another insert, basically a false elevator, can raise up or lower down to bring someone on the stage or off the stage. Well, that concludes my project. I hope you all enjoyed the trap door, and I look forward to seeing you all this upcoming semester. Have a good one.